For most navies, replacing a missile is a routine procurement story. For the Royal Navy, bringing the Norwegian-designed naval strike missile into service later this year is something else entirely. It is the closing of a capability gap, the recalibration of maritime strike doctrine, and a quiet signal about where Britain expects its surface fleet to operate, and against whom. Let's start with the uncomfortable truth that has been hanging over the fleet since December 2023, when Harpoon went out of service. Harpoon was not perfect, and it was certainly not modern by today's standards, but it did one critical thing. It gave British surface combatants a credible ship-launched anti-ship punch. When that disappeared, the Navy didn't just lose an old weapon, it lost a straightforward deterrent message. If you are an adversary commander looking at a British task group, you ask a simple question. What can those escorts do to me at range right now from the surface? For a period, the answer became less convincing than it should have been for a major maritime power. That is why Luke Pollard's written confirmation matters. He frames the naval strike missile as 20 years newer, with greater range and far greater capability than Harpoon. That sounds like political packaging, but it points to something real. This is not merely a like-for-like -like replacement. The Navy is moving from a legacy anti-ship weapon designed for a different era into a system built for today's reality, where sensors are contested, electronic warfare is aggressive, and naval combat is increasingly about who can find, target, and strike first beyond the horizon. And the timeline is not theoretical. The Royal Navy already fired the missiles successfully in September 2025 when HMS Somerset, a Type 23 frigate, launched an NSM during Exercise Eager off northern Norway. That detail is doing a lot of work. This was not a sterile range test in home waters. It was conducted at Andoya alongside Norwegian and Polish forces as part of wider NATO cooperation in the high north. So ask yourself, if you wanted to demonstrate interoperability and shared maritime strike capability with a close regional partner, where would you do it? And against what strategic backdrop? The High North is not a backdrop chosen at random. It is a theater where geography compresses decision time, where weather and distance punish mistakes, and where NATO's maritime posture has to account for peer-level capabilities operating from protected bastions. In that context, the first live British NSM shot is as much about signaling as it is about engineering. It says the UK is not just buying a missile, it is plugging into a network, training ranges, procedures and operational concepts built with allies who live with this problem set every day. Technically, the naval strike missile is designed to survive in the modern environment. It is sea skimming, which is table stakes now, but what matters is how it navigates and how it finds its target at the end. The manufacturer describes a guidance package combining inertial navigation and GPS with terrain contour matching and an imaging infrared seeker for terminal guidance. Put that together and you get a weapon intended to cope with real-world friction, jamming, deception, and the chaos of literal environments where a radar picture can be cluttered or manipulated. The missile's warhead, 120 kilograms of blast and fragmentation, and a speed approaching Mach 0.9 won't impress anyone who is only looking at headline numbers. The point is not brute force, it is the probability of getting to the target and doing enough damage to mission kill a high-value ship. Range is the headline everyone repeats, and for NSM it matters, over 200 kilometers operationally, with later variants exceeding 300 kilometers. But range is only meaningful if you can generate targeting at that distance. This is the part that rarely makes it into press releases. Beyond the radar horizon, a ship cannot simply see what it wants to shoot. So the real question is not how far can NSM fly, it is how well can the Royal Navy find, track, classify, and maintain custody on a target at that distance in a contested environment long enough to launch. If the sensor and data link architecture is strong, NSM becomes a decisive tool. If it is weak, range becomes marketing. This is why the acquisition sits within Pollard's broader language about modernizing and increasing the lethality of the fleet, with sea venom and NSM as key aspects. Lethality is not a single weapon. It is the integration of weapons into a kill chain. NSM adds a modern, credible strike option to escorts, but it also forces the fleet to take targeting seriously airborne sensors, off-board data, cooperative engagement concepts, and the procedural muscle memory of operating in a NATO maritime picture that may be degraded, jammed, or incomplete. In other words, the missile drags the rest of the system upward if the Navy does the hard work to match it. Now, consider the platform plan. The UK intends to equip 11 surface combatants drawn from the Type 23 frigate and Type 45 destroyer classes. On paper, that is a pragmatic approach. These are the ships the Navy has now and they are the ones that escort carriers, protect high-value units, and operate forward with allies. But it also invites a strategic question. Is 11 enough to shift the calculus in a major theater, or is it a minimum viable deterrent while the Navy transitions to future force structure? Because numbers matter. A small inventory of modern missiles can restore credibility, but it can also be consumed quickly in high-intensity scenarios. 
And even before you get to wartime expenditure, there is the day-to-day -day reality of readiness. Not every ship is deployed, not every ship is at high readiness, and not every ship will be armed out the same way at the same time. If you want an adversary to assume a British escort has a credible anti-ship weapon, the weapon has to be common enough that the assumption becomes rational. Otherwise, you get the opposite effect. Uncertainty that works against deterrence rather than for it. Still, even limited fielding changes planning. The retirement of Harpoon created ambiguity. The introduction of NSM removes it. A peer competitor now has to assume that a British task group escort can contribute to a distributed maritime strike problem not just defend itself with air defense missiles and guns. That matters in choke points, in literal approaches, and in situations where the carrier is not the only ship that must be taken seriously. The Type 45 in particular has long been viewed primarily through the lens of air defense. Adding a modern anti-ship and potentially land attack capability complicates the adversary's assessment of what that ship can do in a fight. And that land attack angle is worth emphasizing. NSM is described as designed for both anti-ship and land attack roles. Even if the Royal Navy prioritizes maritime strike, the very existence of a credible land attack option from escorts broadens operational choices. It creates dilemmas for an adversary along a coastline. Do you disperse assets, harden infrastructure, expand air defense coverage, and accept that naval escorts might contribute to strike packages? Or do you gamble that they cannot generate targeting and therefore won't be used that way? Either way, your planning burden increases, and that is what capability is supposed to do. The political framing here, the Lunar House Agreement, the emphasis on UK-Norway cooperation, the NATO trial at Andoya, also suggest something else. Speed and reliability mattered. Buying a proven missile from a close partner is not just about performance. It is about reducing integration risk and accelerating fielding. After a capability gap opens, the worst outcome is an endless development program that arrives late. Off-the-shelf procurement paired with live firing in 2025 and service entry expected in 2026 looks like a deliberate attempt to compress that timeline. The message is, the Navy wants this capability in sailors' hands, on decks, in magazines, and in doctrines, not in PowerPoint. So what should we take away from this? First, the Royal Navy is restoring a core surface warfare capability that should never have been allowed to lapse without a clear successor. Second, it is doing so in a way that aligns with NATO's northern maritime priorities and deepens interoperability with Norway and other allies. Third, the real story is not the missile in isolation, but the kill chain it forces the fleet to build sensors, targeting, networking, and joint operations in contested conditions. And finally, the scale of fielding 11 ships will be enough to change local calculations, but it also raises the strategic question of whether Britain is building a broadly distributed maritime strike posture or simply buying time until the next generation of systems arrives. If you want a single line that captures why this matters, it's this. A navy is only as credible as the capabilities it can bring to bear from the ships it actually deploys. With NSM entering service later in 2026, the Royal Navy is not just replacing Harpoon, it is re-entering a conversation about maritime strike that has become unforgiving, fast-moving, and increasingly decisive. And in an era when deterrence is measured in what you can do in the first hours, not the first weeks, that shift is not optional, it is overdue.